Good evening. Thank you for joining us online for tonight's service. What a great morning we had in church. It's so good to be in the church auditorium and meet here. Great message from pastor today. Just thinking about how wonderful Jesus is and the birth. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. And thank you all for being here for that. And we look forward to tonight. We want to begin, though, in a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you. I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for bringing each one of us here to this, this area in this time and to this church. I thank you for what you've done in our lives. I thank you for this year, a different year, but a year that you knew about and that you have a purpose for. I pray that you would help us as we finish out this year to finish out doing our very best to serve you, not to earn your favor because we already have it, but just because we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. A few announcements. We will not have any services on Wednesday night. We moved it to the next night, Thursday. So Thursday, we will have our Christmas Eve service. That will be at 5 p.m. And again, it, we will have it here in the auditorium. Everyone is invited. If you have family in town, invite them to come with you as we just spend some time thinking about what Christmas is all about and worshiping our Savior together. So Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., that's Thursday. We will also be live streaming that. We know many of you are traveling. So if you are gone, if you're able to jump on there uh, live, we'd encourage you to. And just to, again, one of the special services here at Mountain Avenue Baptist Church every single year and coming up on Thursday. And next Sunday, the last service in 2020 for the church here. And so we look forward to, uh, to meeting together at 9 a.m. and at 1030. And if you are able to join us for those services, I encourage you to be here. Our 1030 service, we will have a children's program in the back for all of the kids. And it was great this morning getting to hear them sing some of the Christmas songs. But during that 1030 service, we will have uh, the program for the kids in the back there. So again, encourage you to be a part of those services. And right before we get into God's Word today, we have a video just to help us remember a little bit more about what Christmas is all about, and then we'll get into God's Word. From high above us, God sees. From far beyond us, God hears. From his eternal distant home, God loves. He sees all people in all places. And it's easy for us to imagine that he does so from this perspective. High, beyond, distant. But then, Christmas. It appears without earthly fanfare or celebration. The cry of this child screams that the same God who is above and beyond and distant has not only come close to us, but that he's indeed with us. So what if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Today, now, with us, the manger proclaims that the very presence of God is now present with us. In the mundane, in the uncertainty, in the mystery that lies beyond our understanding or explanation, God himself is with us in our joy and our happiness. He's with us in our sadness and our brokenness. He celebrates in the light with us, and he holds us in the dark with faithful and secure arms. What if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Christmas not only begs that we ask that question, but also provides the answer that our hearts have been longing for all along. Can this possibly be? Yes, it can. And it is God with us. 
Emmanuel, and he's closer than our wildest dreams can ever imagine. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. What a great video. A great reminder for each and every one of us that God is with us. If you have your Bibles, take it and turn to Matthew chapter number one. Matthew chapter number one. And again, just uh, looking forward to today getting into God's word as we look a little bit more at the events of that very first Christmas. Have you ever heard something unbelievable? I mean, there's several things that I'm sure we have heard unbelievable. Let me, let me ask you this. If somebody would have told you five years ago that the events of this year would happen and play out the way that they did, would you have believed them? <laughs> Could you have imagined basically everything being shut down? I mean, it'd be hard for any of us to imagine, but we know it happened. You know, I was thinking about uh, growing up, uh, when I was in high school, I got a job working at that fine uh, restaurant, Long John Silver's. <laughs> and I uh, worked there for almost three years. And during my time, I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, just, just a way that God provided for me to raise money to go to college and to provide for my needs there. Became close to some of the people that worked there. The manager there, uh, she was a uh, lady that came to our church a few times, but uh, she wanted someone to watch her kids. So my sister, who's a little bit younger than me, began watching her kids. And sometimes I would bring them there and then take them back to, uh, to her house and all of this different things. I remember one time in particular, uh, her children, I want to say one was five and one was two. Uh, I, I was picking them up and bringing them back. And I had gotten my license not too long before that. And I'm going down one of these uh, highways in Indiana. And as I'm going down it, I come up over the hill and I see a police officer going the other direction. Now, most of you will probably know the feeling I'm about to describe as you know you're going a little bit too fast. So you try to slow down, but at that point it is too late. And then, you ever done this before? You're looking in the rear view mirror. Don't turn around, don't turn around. He turned around. I'm like, great. Right, he turns around, he pulls me over, and now I'm thinking, I'm like, oh man, this is, this is not good, not good at all. And then, he gave me a warning. Praise the Lord for a warning, right? And I'm just, I'm happy about that. And then I remember, in the back seat are my boss's two children. And I'm like, she's going to kill me. You know, for, probably fire me first and then kill me. And so I, I'm thinking this whole way as I'm taking the kids over there. I'm like, it's, you know, I'm done. I'm done. Maybe I can apply for a different job. I mean, there's no, and, and we get there. And we get there, and I remember it was, I was dropping them off at a baseball field. Don't know why, but I'm dropping them off there. And we go in and, and find her, and the kids go up to her, and, and her little two-year-old girl goes up and begins to tell her the story. And I'm like, I'm in trouble. But then I remembered something. This little girl has a very vivid imagination. In fact, she has told us before how uh, her mom would serve them snakes and go out and get the, uh, you know, cut off the heads and then bring in and they would have snake for dinner and all this, you know, and it just, just had an imagination like that. And so I can see as she's telling my boss this story, my boss is not believing it. And I don't know if this was right or wrong. I neither confirmed or denied the story that that little girl was saying that day. And she just sort of laughed it off and, and, you know, didn't really realize that, hey, we did get pulled over because I, as like a 16-year-old guy, was driving a little too fast down the road. But when she heard the story from her daughter, she's like, I, I don't believe that. And in this case, it was because her daughter didn't necessarily have a track record of believing what she said. You know, one of the great things about Christmas is the fact that we see that what God says will happen, will happen. No matter how unbelievable it is, it will happen. You're in Matthew chapter number 1. I want you to look at verse number 18, Matthew 1, 18. And really there's two accounts of in the Gospels that really go through the birth of Jesus Christ, Matthew and Luke. Both of them begin with genealogies. But in Matthew 1, 18, the genealogy has just finished. 
And it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus was born of a virgin, Mary. Luke gives us the account of the angel appearing to Mary and telling her. And remember, Mary's first response was, how can this be, seeing as how I know not a man? We come to Matthew, and we see that the information has now been given to Joseph. Again, we know these events of the Bible so much that we forget that the people in these events didn't know it the same way we do. Can you imagine Mary seeing Joseph? And now she can no longer hide the fact that she is pregnant. Can you imagine that conversation as she tells Joseph, Joseph, it's not what you think. Joseph, I promise I have done nothing wrong. Joseph, it's God. An angel appeared. An angel told me all of this, told me that I would have a son, told me that, that it was from the Holy Ghost, and told me that he would be the Messiah. Joseph, this is what happened. Now imagine being Joseph, hearing that. Would you have believed it? Seems very, very hard to believe. An angel? You're pregnant, but you're saying that, that you are still a virgin? Mary, how can this be? Mary, at least, I mean, at least tell me the truth of what happened. And the conversation ends. Joseph goes to his house. Mary, back to hers. Remember, they are, they're engaged to be married. It's a very serious thing. Not like engagements today, where engagement today, you can end it really at any time. Back then, to end an engagement, you would have to basically get a, real, uh, a, a divorce. You would have to have that. So this was a much bigger deal here. Joseph goes back to his house. He processes this information. And I don't know about you. I, how could anyone believe that? Believe that what Mary was saying actually happened. It makes no human sense. But she's saying this is the case. And Joseph, he goes to his house. And that's where it picks up. Joseph is trying to make the decision of what am I going to do? Joseph, at this point, could have had Mary basically killed, executed for the crime. I mean, let her tell the judge her story and see if he believes it. But Joseph doesn't want to do that. But that night, he goes to sleep. I'm sure that night sleep didn't come easily to him. Because everything going on in his mind, his hopes and dreams, they've all changed in a matter of hours. And he goes to sleep that night not knowing that that night would change everything for him. Verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people for their sins. The angel comes. You know what the angel says? What Mary had told him. Hey, Joseph, it's true. I know it's unbelievable. 
I know that you can't wrap your mind around this, but I'm telling you, Joseph, what she said is absolutely true. Understand that Jesus' birth was miraculous. Miraculous. There is no other way to describe it. Any birth is miraculous. But Jesus was so different. Here he is, going to be born to save his people from their sins, going to be born of a virgin. Nobody would believe this story. But this was the truth. How do I apply that to my life? I trust God to accomplish his plan. Do you know sometimes God's plan doesn't make sense? This was a plan that God had set in motion in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, verse number 15, talks about the seed of woman coming and defeating Satan. So this was a plan, and the Bible says it was set in motion before the foundations of the world. So this was a plan that didn't make sense to everybody else. Has that ever happened with you in your life? You look back and you say, God, why is this happening this way? God, this doesn't make sense this way. I mean, let's all be honest. If we were the ones planning out our lives, there would be many events in our lives that would have gone completely different than what they've gone. But we don't plan out our lives. God does. And I believe if we're also honest, and we go back and look at some of those plans we have for our lives, anyone else have plans for their lives they're glad that didn't happen? But you can see now how God worked and you had a plan. And sometimes there's even things in our lives we pray for. God, would you allow this to happen? And it didn't happen. But now looking back years later, you can say, God, thank you for not answering that prayer the way I wanted you to. God, his ways are not our ways. Why? Because his thoughts aren't ours. They're higher than ours. And we need to. Trust Him to accomplish His plan. You know, the promises of God, the plans of God will happen no matter what the odds are. The odds sometimes are not very good. Sometimes we'll watch different sports games, and some of the things they do now is they will give you, like at the bottom of the screen, sometimes like a chance that this team has to win this game. And it'll, it'll be updated during the game. So if one team goes up, you know, the chances go up until I've seen somewhere it's like a 99% chance that it will happen. It does not matter what people will look at God's plan and say, think about this. Hey, here, what's God's plan? A virgin will have a child that will be born and rule over the entire world. The chances of that happening one would say, are 100% in the negative. It's a zero, or maybe they could say a 0% chance of happening, I guess. It's never going to happen. There's no chance. But when God says it, it will happen. Jesus had a miraculous birth, and because of that, I can trust God to accomplish his plan. Not only was it a miraculous birth, it was a birth that was promised. You're in uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse number 22 says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bid him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Exactly what the prophet said. Or exactly what the angel had told him to to call. We see mention of a prophecy coming from the book of Isaiah that would have been at least 700 years before Joseph is hearing this right now. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What we see in verse number 23 there. 700 years before it happens, God is saying it is going to happen. 
we can look throughout Scripture and see many Scriptures, many prophecies talking about Jesus, the Messiah, being born. Isaiah 9, 6, which pastor preached on this morning, for unto us a child is born. The Messiah would come as a child. It was prophesied that he would be of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and of the lineage of David, which is why when we look at these genealogies, they're so important. We see where he was going to be born. Micah 5, verse number 2. He would be born in Bethlehem, a small town in southern Israel. Nothing really exciting. The greatest claim to fame of Bethlehem, David lived here at one point. Besides that, you don't have a lot. But it says exactly where he would be born. And think about this. How unusual is it? The prophecy was known that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Why choose parents from Nazareth? Why not just choose parents in Bethlehem? That would make sense. But again, God's ways are different than ours. We see all of these prophecies that Jesus fulfills in his birth. Prophecies about kings coming. Prophecies about weeping in the town. All of this happens. And when we look at the prophecies that happen, we can apply this by relying on everything God says in His Word. Here is where it becomes very practical. If God says it, it will happen, no matter how unbelievable it is. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We know that verse, right? Have you ever felt like that verse isn't true? And before you feel too badly on that, David felt like that often, and we see it in the Psalms. But it is true. God did say it. We look at this world and we see all the craziness, and we're like, is anybody in control? God is in control. It does not matter what I feel or what I see because the truth is always true. And what God said, think about all the prophecies that come to pass in Jesus Christ that were prophesied hundreds of years before his birth, before his life, his death, burial, resurrection, and they come true. Look at many other prophecies in the scripture that it says this will happen, and it happens. So when I look at all of that, of course I can trust him. Everything he said that I can verify has come to pass. So I can rely on him. We live in a very skeptical society, and that's probably good, right? (laughs) You've gotten the emails where you're a beneficiary of $5 million. You just got to give them your bank information to get that. We've all gotten those, right? And we get them and we're like, I don't know about this. We're very skeptical of everything we hear. And in many cases, that's good. But when we come to God's word, it's okay to be skeptical. But study it and find out that it is true. Jesus The fact he was born in Bethlehem of a virgin, how much does that prove to us how good God is and how we can rely on him? And then Matthew chapter number two, we come to some men. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, who are these men? We don't really know. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details. Some people believe they're from Persia, some Central Asia, closer to China. Some believe maybe Jewish scholars uh, that had interaction uh, with some of Daniel's writings and different things like that. How many of them? We don't know. Bible never tells us. Never tells us who they are, 
their names. Now, traditions gives us some names, but we don't know if those are true, but it never gives us their names. It never gives us where they're from. It never gives how many came because it, the wise men are not the important people in this event. It tells us who they came to see, and that's what's important. But they come, and they, they come to Herod in verse number 2 and say, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Listen, if Herod was troubled, everybody else was troubled. Herod is a, a very great leader in the sense of building and in keeping his control. He will stop at nothing to keep it. History tells us killing some of his own family members to make sure that he stays in power. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Wise men worshipped the promise. Savior. They came on a long journey, a dangerous journey, for one reason, to worship Jesus. They came to worship Jesus. You know, the proper result of hearing and following God's teaching is always worship. And this is what they've done. They came all this way to worship Jesus. Apply this in my life by drawing closer to Christ and worshiping Him as my Savior. This is what Christmas is about. It's about Him. In 2020, there are so many distractions around Christmas time. But it's not about any of those things. This week, you have a lot to accomplish, more than likely. Some of us are finishing Christmas shopping. Some of us starting Christmas shopping. Some of us preparing big meals. Others, maybe travel plans. There's a lot going on. But it's not about all those things. Oh, I enjoy all of them. It's about the Savior. It's about worshiping Him. It's about this Christmas, me drawing closer to Him. I don't have to travel a long way like these wise men did to worship the Savior. I don't have to travel a long way to draw closer to Him. I can do that right where I'm at. And this Christmas, will you make that a priority? Saying this Christmas, I want to get closer to him than I've ever been. I want to get in his word more. I just want to spend more time just praising his name. I want to spend more time praying and thanking him. You can do that. But with all the busyness that goes on, sometimes we find that hard to fit in the schedule. What are lessons we can learn from that first Christmas? I can trust God no matter what he says, even if it sounds impossible. <laughs> to Joseph, this is impossible. But he learned when God says something, it will happen like he said. So the promises that God has made to me, I can trust even when it doesn't make sense. The purpose of Christmas, it's a baby that deserves to be worshipped. And understand, Jesus 
is not a baby anymore. Well, the next time he comes to this earth, he will come as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will plant his feet on the Mount of Olives and begin to rule and reign over all of creation. He deserves to be worshipped. So this Christmas, trust him. And Christmas proves it. If there was ever something that God said that just seemed like there's no way it can happen, and it did, it was the fact that a virgin would bring forth a child. And if there is ever someone that deserves to be worshipped, it is Jesus. Oh, remember his other name? Emmanuel. God with us. God in human flesh on this earth to save each and every one of us from our sins. Trust Him. Worship Him this Christmas. Dear God, I thank You for today. I thank You for Christmas. I thank You for the lessons that we can learn from Your Son coming to this earth. And God, I pray that You would help each one of us to draw closer to You, to trust You more this Christmas. We love You. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Again, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's service. And let me encourage you, Thursday, we look forward, 5 p.m., to meeting together and spending a little bit of time worshiping Him, thinking about what Christmas is all about. So if you're able to be here in person, we invite you. If you're able to just join us online, we invite you to do that as well. Thank you again for being a part of the service, and we look forward to worshiping together on Thursday, and have a very Merry Christmas.